Well, we've seen a number of mass shootings across the United States over the past few decades, and they've all been tragic, but they've all had one thing in common. Can you name it? But if you think about it real hard, you probably wouldn't be able to come up with an answer. Is it skin color? No, there's been white mass shooters, black mass shooters, Asian mass shooters. That has nothing to do with it. In fact, the, ma the mainstream media would love to keep this entirely quiet, but they do all have one thing in common. They've all been on antidepressants, SSRIs something that the mainstream media and big pharma don't want you to know about. Why are we not being told about this? Hmm, we'll get to the bottom of that. Our next guest is a leading global drug safety advocate. Her name is Kim Witzak. She's become involved in this issue uh, when her husband tragically suddenly died due to an undisclosed side effect of an antidepressant. She's now on the FDA advisory committee, and she's made it her mission to educate all of us about these dangers. Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, it's such an important issue, and I think it's probably informative for our audience. First of all, it's amazing to hear that you're on the FDA advisory committee now, and that just made my head spin when I first heard that. But I think it's informative for our audience to kind of go back and really set the stage here and how you got involved in this. Can you tell us what happened to your husband specifically? I think you call yourself an accidental advocate now. Can you kind of walk us back and paint a picture for us? Sure. Well, I call myself the accidental advocate because I never chose to do this work. And sometimes our greatest purposes choose us. And I was married um, back in 2003 to my best friend, my husband of 10 years. And um, on August 6, 2003, I got a call that forever changed my life. My dad called to tell me that my husband was found hanging from the rafter of our garage, dead at age 37. And Woody wasn't depressed. Woody had no history of depression or any other mental illness. Woody had just started his dream job with a startup company and was having trouble sleeping. And Woody was a guy who needed eight hours of sleep. And, you know, he wasn't getting eight hours of sleep. So he, as a lot of people did um, and do, he went to his doctor because he was having trouble sleeping. And Woody was, I always called him like the Humpty Dumpty, you know, the doctors put him back together. He was an athlete. And so he did, you know, he just did what he would have done, which is like, hey, doc, I'm not sleeping. And the doctor gave him a three week sample pack of an antidepressant Zoloft and told him it would take the edge off and help him sleep. And I happened to be out of the country during those first three weeks that he was put on the drug. We both traveled for our careers and I was down in New Zealand on an advertising production. So I wasn't there when Woody first got put on these drugs and the dosage changed. But I will never forget when I came back to um, back home and I was excited to see him and, and I'll never forget, he walked through our back door. He was in a blue dress shirt, was like completely drenched through. It fell on the floor and with his hands around his head and he's like, Kim, you gotta help me. I don't know what's happening to me. It's like my head's outside my body looking in. He's rocking back and forth, bawling. And I had never seen this before. And I remember we calmed him down and we like, let's pray, let's breathe, let's, you know, you know, whatever this thing was. And he called his doctor, somebody who he's seen for years. And the doctor said, you got to give it four to six weeks to kick in. And so. So to stay, to stay on it, to stay yeah. on these drugs, not yeah. to, not to get off of them, yeah. but to stay on it. Yeah. So I don't think, and it's kind of one of the things that, you know, we'll get into it, but it's one of the things that a lot of times when people are having adverse events, um, events or effects by these drugs, doctors don't recognize it being a side effect of the drug. And this was a side effect of the drug, clearly. But Woody was told to stay on it. So every night the next week of his life, Woody came home and he'd be like, what do you think about hypnosis? What do you think about acupuncture? Everything was to beat this feeling out of his head. And so on August 6th, I will never forget, I was, it was my busy time of my season and I was out of town and I hadn't heard from him. So I'm like, hey dad, do me a favor, go check and see if, you know, Woody's um, all right. I'm thinking he maybe hit his head, like he was having trouble sleeping. Never in a million, million, million years would have I expected to get the call that I did that my husband was hanging. Cause Wood loved life. And, 
that night, I'll never forget, you know, I'm in Detroit trying to figure out how to get back home. And the coroner got on the phone and asked me um, um, one question. She goes, was he taking any medication? And the only medication Woody was on was Zoloft. And she said, we might have to take it with, we're going to take it with us. It might have something to do with his death. And so that was clue number one. And clue number two was the front page of our newspaper had an article that said the UK finds link between antidepressant and suicide in teens. And so those were really like, wouldn't I, you know, like I said, we both traveled all the time and we left notes for each other. And I'm like, literally, Wood, you went on your biggest trip of your life and you didn't leave a note, but those were his notes. I really believe, you know, that meaning, you know, the question that the coroner asked and the front page of the paper that night. And then intuitively in every part of my body, I knew there's no way Woody would take his own life. So really my brother-in-law Googled um, that night, Googled Zoloft and suicide. And literally did, um, we had no idea that in 1991, the FDA held hearings on the um, link between violence and suicide and Prozac. And at that time, all of the committee members voted, they said, nope, we don't see any, um, there's no link. Fast forward, the FDA tells Eli Lilly to study suicidality. They never did. The FDA never followed up. Meanwhile, we now get um, Zoloft on the market. We have Paxil on the market. It gets approved for kids. And that is really the scenario of what was going on in 2003 when my husband died tragically. I'm so sorry. Unbelievable and incredibly tragic. And, and I think you would maybe argue totally preventable. A hundred percent preventable. You know, I even look back and, you know, why did he get an antidepressant? Like he didn't even know it was an antidepressant. You know, he just did with what a lot of people do, which is trust their doctors, right? Trust that their doctor is giving them a medication that's supposed to help them, certainly not hurt him. And then I think, you know, the other thing I learned is, you know, the doctors believe and trust that the FDA has done their job. Right. So the whole system is built in um, built on this, you know, this premise of trust and faith and, you know, the the white coat and, you know, doctors know better than you. And so there's so many things that went wrong. And really, that became kind of our mission that to go get warnings put on these um, on these drugs and get black box warnings, because at this time, there were no FDA black box suicide warnings on these medications. So it became, as I like to call it, our battle for Woody. And so it involved, I mean, I had, you know, I got on a plane and I kept going back and forth to Washington, D.C. We worked with Congress, met with FDA officials. Uh, we had a big, I had a big wrongful death lawsuit against Pfizer and also used the media, you know, the media you know, Woody's story was told because it was opposite. And at this point, we also connected with a lot of families. There were so many families and parents of kids that were given these medications to like for test anxiety. They broke up with their boyfriends. They're having, you know, trouble adjusting to new moves. And so you start putting that all together and it told a very different story than what was being told to the public and, you know, looking at all of the, the environment in which we live in to the advertising environment, right? And everybody was like, Prozac, it's the happy pill. And, you know, so you go back and you look at all of what was happening out there and the narrative that was being told at that time. But once you start really digging in and, you know, um, I think one of the biggest things was meeting the families, hearing, seeing what the FDA was doing, but literally having that lawsuit against Pfizer, where um, my lawyers, you know, the documents that they got out from under seal showed a very, very different story than what we were being told. 
Let's talk about this, the power of litigation, right? We are, it's incredibly sad. We've seen it with COVID, of course. We're seeing it with COVID medications and vaccines, quote unquote vaccines, that we're really only getting answers thanks to lawsuits. We're only getting answers thanks to litigation. And I used to be of the opinion, you know, years ago, oh, America is the most sue happy country in the world, you know. Now I'm okay with it. To be honest with you, I'm okay with it because we get answers. We get answers through litigation, through discovery process, seeing these documents that these, these companies are being kept under seal for so long and wouldn't share with us. Uh, so can you talk about this sort of spider web that you started to uncover and unravel thanks to these lawsuits? Sure. Well, first of all, I kind of had that same attitude that you did about lawsuits. They're frivolous. You know, it, that was kind of what we were being told, right? They're frivolous. Like, I'll never forget like that woman who sued, I think it was McDonald's for putting the coffee cup, right? right? And spilled. And I'm like, she, she got burned with the coffee. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I remember going, oh, she's an idiot. Like, why would you put that? Well, what I subsequently learned, actually, that lawsuit was pivotal in changing the temperature in which coffee at fast food restaurants is sold. So yeah, I in fact, I it's crazy. It's crazy. You bring up this story. Can I just a little point yeah. of privilege here? A friend of mine actually worked on a documentary for, I think, 48 hours at the time, the television show, 48 hours. And she was so when I I had the same reaction to that. And she said, we worked on the story about the woman who burned herself with uh, the coffee, you know, and I laughed. I said, come on, you can't you know, sue McDonald's because of that. Yeah. Then you dive deeply into it and you realize how the, those mechanical, those coffee pots were being blasted. And anyway, it's much more, it's much deeper than just this, oh, she's an idiot for having a coffee cup in her lap. And that's how it, it was really, really fascinating to challenge my belief system on that, I guess is the way to yeah, say it, right? Yeah. And, and that's kind of how it was for me. But, you know, one thing even, and it is one of the elements, and we'll get into the, the spider web, but is how um, pharma knows how to work the legal system too, right? And, you know, during this mm -hmm. time, a lot of people don't realize that Pfizer had given a guy who got appointed chief counsel at the FDA, Dan Troy, um, he was appointed the chief counsel and started intervening in private lawsuits against Pfizer by using something called the preemption brief, basically saying even if Pfizer wanted to warn, they wouldn't, the FDA didn't see it as an issue. So preemption, you know, took over states' rights, et cetera. So we helped to expose that. And it was interesting because that was kind of the first like sign of this idea of ro revolving doors. So Dan Troy eventually got exposed. He left and went to and he went on to become the global counsel for GlaxoSmithKline. And so it was one of those things like even the ability to hold drug companies accountable. We were able to hold Pfizer accountable and were able to get all these documents out through it wasn't discovered in my lawsuit they were discovered because there were all sorts of lawsuits that were happening during this time and i don't know if you remember uh um bill hartman who was on saturday night live and he yes 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 yeah and so he got murdered he was murdered by his wife and then um she killed herself well she had just started right. zoloft and they had big litigation the family did against pfizer but it was all secretly settled and so, you know, there were a yeah. lot of things were happening during the time of Woody's death. And so anyways, this um, law firm that I work with, and they're one of the top out there out in LA, they were able to get these, these documents were all sealed. I mean, they were sealed. Pfizer for many years argued that they were trade secret, but the federal judge in my case looked at it and said, this isn't federal, these aren't trade secrets. So he released them and I literally, went around DC with binders full of documents. And these documents told a very different story that the FDA and Pfizer knew about it. It was also the behaviors of how the companies like talking about withdrawal. Let's not tell that. Wait a minute. Can you back up a second? Because I, I just want to be very clear. When you were going around these documents or showing that the FDA and Pfizer knew about these side effects and the withdrawal side effects and a whole host of other side effects. They knew about it and they kept it from the American people. Yes. Right? That's what was in these documents. Yes. Okay. And I, will, I just wanted to be very clear about that. I have my binder here. So this wow. is the binder that I literally marched around Washington, DC, met with any like the members of Congress, 
hand delivered them to the FDA that showed how Pfizer actually um, looked at, you know, they, the FDA was asking about some side effects um, in report and they, and Pfizer's response was, should we give them the simple, straightforward report or the complicated, confusing one? I'm like, how is that even possible? Like, of course you should give them the simple, straightforward answer their questions. But that's not what they do. Right. So they play games, you know, looking at like, I didn't realize that even um, Fluxetine, which is Prozac in Germany, it initially was never approved for two reasons, lack of efficacy and risk of suicide. That was in the 80s. And so eventually the FDA approved it. They got it approved, the BGA, which is the FDA equivalent in Germany. They did get it approved. Now, wouldn't that be kind of nice for the public and even our doctors to understand that there's a whole history of these medications? And there was even right. a document inside um, that Pfizer was said, I don't think fluxetine, which is the generic name or the chemical name for Prozac, is out of it, the woods yet with its association with suicide and violence. And so they knew about it. This is in the 90s. Woody died in 2003, and now we're at 2024. And it just, it continues to go. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at documents because they tell a very, very, very different story. Something you said at the beginning of the interview is that the FDA was holding these hearings or having these meetings, at least, back in, I think what you said, 1991 on suicide, right? They were having these meetings and members of Congress were just sort of signing off on it, saying there's nothing here. So first of all, did they know then when they were holding these meetings that it was causing, that it, the, that was one of the side effects? And number two, if they were do, if they were holding these meetings and they had, the FDA had this information and data from Germany and other places, were they hiding and covering it up? Yeah, so going back to the 91 hearings, if you look at who's on it, and that's, it's ironic because that's actually the FDA advisory committee I sit on today, the Psychopharmologic Drugs Advisory Committee. Almost every member on that committee had financial ties to the companies who were making antidepressant makers. And so that's where I learned about that, right? Again, um, and now I do think there were things that the FDA may not have known because um, there were some documents that came out of from like Pfizer UK that was happening over in another part of the world. Now should, because Pfizer is responsible for all of their global, right? Even if they, they know what's happening in the UK, maybe the FDA doesn't. And, you know, maybe we didn't have the same kind of connections and, you know, um, information sharing that we do today. But Pfizer knew. So somebody knew yeah. about this, right? But, you know, and you look back at those 91 hearings where those, you know, the, the members had ties to industry making other antidepressants, not the Prozac. That wasn't just on suicide. That was suicide and violence. And so we, I always have to remind people that that hearing wasn't, even though Woody died of suicide, which in my mind, suicide is just violence against yourself versus homicide is violence against others. But they were already investigating that link in 91. Wow. It's so really, let's talk about some of the side effects here. I mean, I, sure. let's, let's really kind of dive into maybe some of the different medications and some of the side effects that we know exist, verifiably exist in the documents and it's provable. Can you walk through some of those? Sure. Well, one of the ones that was actually kept from the public is a side effect called akathisia. AK, um, akathisia is a, like an internal agitation where you just want to like scratch it out of you. You're constantly moving. It's kind of um, where like Woody, that head outside the body. And literally one of the documents that um, was Pfizer chief medical officer, Dr. Roger Lane had written an article t discussing what akathisia is in a journal that is public. But what wasn't public was the memo that he sent to his sales staff that said the attached journal article may not be suitable for general practitioners, but only for neuro neurologically inclined psych um, psychiatrists. And in that um, journal article, he said, if a person experiences akathisia, which is that internal like 
restlessness, quote unquote, his words, death may be a welcome result because you just want it to end. And so they kept that from GPs. And so this is what I'm saying, like when you saw all this in black and white on their letterhead, this is, and my husband's dead and you guys knew this, like, I don't understand. So that is one that is a very, that it sounds like Malthusian. I mean, not to get to a whole other level, but it sounds like Malthusian, almost like population control in a way. Like they're excited about this idea. I mean, we see it in Canada. They're certainly happy about it up there. Um, they know about it and they're, they're just fine to go along with it. Yeah, exactly. So this was something they knew and it's called the akathisia. Other ones are like, you know, now we're learning about all this sexual dysfunction that is happening from antidepressants, which, you know, some of that might be more stopping people from taking these, you know, medications. Um, there's the withdrawal. There's issues when you stop these drugs that, um, that you, there, some people like even Paxil had huge litigation against withdrawal. People couldn't get off of these medications because their bodies were addicted. So they knew there was an addictive quality. There also were um, things, links to heart defects and birth defects with parents. And they were telling the moms it was fine to be on your antidepressant during pregnancy. And so these were all during- But wait, wait, they were telling them it's fine even though they knew it wasn't? Yeah, somebody, they had litigation about this afterwards. Mm -hmm. So this is where people like, once you start looking, it's also why I always tell people before you go on any medication, just go see if there's any litigation because litigation doesn't just happen, right? But those are some of the right. side effects. And then, of course, you brought up at the beginning of the show just the idea of, you know, we've had all these mass shootings. You know, really, I think in my mind, what was going on at that time was Columbine because we had some of the kids from Columbine that actually showed up at the FDA advisory committee meetings in 2004 and 2006, because eventually did um, the FDA did add black box suicide warnings. But there were kids from Columbine that were there that were actually testifying during those hearings. And so I always thought it was really interesting that, you know, again, I go back to my document. Um, there was a Pfizer had a Zoloft prosecutor manual they, that, that was in their files that they were helping to create a prosecutor manual. And it, that was from the, like the 1998. So they clearly knew that there was some kind of link um, to these drugs. And I can literally show you and I'll send you all, you know, send you these documents. Because again, when you see them in black and white in their letterhead, the timeline and then you look at what's happening now. So I never understood. So when we met with the FDA, um, the people responsible for the psychiatric drugs, um, Tom Lochran and Roger um, and um, Bob Temple, and we told them like, how did Woody go from not sleeping five weeks later, head outside his body to dead in five weeks, right? That should make you be curious to go out and investigate. And so, you know, I go when that coroner asked if he was on any medication, that was a, you know, that was a good question that she asked, right? So then when I look at all these shootings, instead of, you know, looking at, you know, everybody goes down like the guns and, you know, goes down that, that path, why aren't we going back? And I don't like, I'm not saying causation. I'm not saying any of that, but we're not even asking the question. Right. Why are we asking? That is a great question. And that's why I sort of started off this piece by talking about that, how it's immediately people go into their corners in the, like a boxing ring. Yeah. You know, pro-gun, anti-gun. Yeah. Totally missing the point, which right. is SSRIs. And the common theme among all of them is SSRIs. Right. They're not being talked about and it's being suppressed. Have you been able to uncover why you think no one's talking about it? Well, I think it's big business. I also think, you know, when I af actually after Parkland, Florida, I remember the Parkland, Florida shooting, um, my attorneys went down to meet with some of the families. I got on a plane. I go, I just need to go talk. Like nobody was paying me to do this. I just needed to go show them the documents because I'm so tired of another one happens, another one happens. And we keep asking the question, why is this happening? I'm like, um, 
it doesn't take a rocket science. Like I'm just a lay person and I can say, why aren't we asking the questions? But once you start looking at the system, right? You know, there's behavioral health and you've got all those that use the antidepressants. It's such a big part of what's going, you know, the system, they shut it down right away saying it's HIPAA. And I think that they don't want it to, um, you know, there are people who will say that they call them the closers, they come in the fixers to like kind of shut up all of the mental health. I've always said, if there's a shooting, HIPAA doesn't apply. I, we need to know what drugs a yeah. person was on and we should be demanding it as the public. And Right, right. Do we really care after this person has killed 15 people, we care about their medical privacy rights? Right. No. I don't. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I've lost I, that. Yeah. I don't care. Like that should be. And so I, you know, every time there's another shooting, I'm like, well, here we go again. It's just like, what is that? Um, the um, Groundhog Day, right? Just it's going right, to right. happen over and over we're again. All yeah. sitting ducks. Like we're all sitting ducks. But instead, it's one of those things that I think, you know, back in the day, even when I look at whether or not people wanted to even recognize the suicide risk. I feel like there's so many people that are on medications anyways, that also don't want to believe that these can cause um, the issue. So I think there's that kind of bias anyways, but then there's the, the money. And even now looking at all of what's happening in America, they're trying to do more and more school-based medical, um, you know, health systems in the school where, you know, they're handing out these, you know, like when I went to school, nurses, you go to the nurse station when you had a stomach ache, but now they're starting to put medical like health centers in schools and, you know, drugs are being handed out. And so I think we need to really take a step back and just ask the question. But if we can't even do it with what we've seen the last three years, I think this is actually another huge, huge issue that we, meaning yeah. you and I, the public, we have to be the ones that demand this because the powers that be are yeah. not going to look at it. No, that's why we're doing this story because I'm, I'm passionate about it. I think it's incredibly important and no one's talking about it. And, uh, and we need to shine a light on this. When you look at these shootings, you see this common denominator in all of them, all of them that at least we know about, at least through court documents and others that, yes, they're all on SSRIs, they're all on these antidepressants, and they don't want you to know about it. And of course, the litigation hides it. I'm curious on the FDA advisory piece of this. So you, you're you now on the FDA advisory committee, the very committee that was looking the other way, was taking money from the pharmaceutical companies and had interests in that regard. So now you're sitting on this FDA advisory committee. Number one, how in the world did that happen? Yeah. It certainly doesn't seem like they'd want you in there. Uh, number two, can you make, have you been able to affect change by being in there? I mean, these drugs are already on the market. Is there a, you're, you're one voice, but are you, how are you, are you able to call attention to this in a larger way at the FDA to have these things pulled off the market? Uh, good question. I know I keep asking, like, how did this happen? How did it get on this committee? But it happened, I think, back years ago when I testified in front of the Senate. One of the FDA commissioners was like, we should get you put on to one of the committees. Little did I know um, that I would actually get placed. I'm the consumer representative. So I voice, I represent the public. And it's an interesting because when I look at that role in a lot of other committees, they like even if I look at the Verpac, which is you know the one right now with the COVID vaccines, that consumer rep is a doctor, and so it's really like it's a very interesting position that I even actually got placed on that position, and so I take my role extremely serious. I get to see doc, you know, I get to see the data before I get to ask questions of not only the FDA but the sponsor. And more importantly, I get to vote whether or not to recommend an approval or not, right? And there's been a couple, I'm often the lone vote. So when you ask, do I feel like I'm making a change? Um, I feel like I hit my head around a big brick wall and think, why am I doing this? Because often I am the only no vote. Because, and I've learned to see that harms and the, that whole safe and effective the game is it's a mar it's marketing it's to get it on the market because once it's on the market 
doctors can use drugs the way they want, right? And so I think safety is always like I've noticed in this safety is like a afterthought. Everybody thinks, oh, it'll eventually get caught down the road. And for me, safety should always be the priority because especially it's new, right? So one of the products, and it's also one that is linked to violence um, and has had is Chantex. So it's not even just the antidepressants that can have links to the violence and the, like the shootings, but Chantex is the um, cessation drug. And Pfizer, mm -hmm. um, it was their product and they wanted to get the black box warning. So there were 2,700 lawsuits um, settled for like $300 million. Then they went to the FDA to get that warning removed. That was a neuropsychiatric violence. I mean, violence was part of it, suicide. And I was excited because now I'm on the committee. So I was going to ask, like, how come, where are all the 2,700 victims? Well, Pfizer shut them all up through litigation. And so they could never tell their story in public. So, they, so I'm like, I was excited because if we're going to remove a warning on these drugs that has never happened, we need to know why, right? And so three days before that hearing that I got a call from the FDA that it had come to their attention that I had an intellectual bias. So I got kicked. I was not able to serve on that committee. Um, but I still showed up. I said, I'm still coming out. I'm going to speak at the public hearing because people like my committee who was going to take a warning off that the whole reason the warning got put on was because of all the lawsuits and all of the, the, the actual harms that came out of and discovered after. And so I, I still showed up, but that is a classic example of what it's like to be on those committees. I would think they would want to hear from somebody like me, but they don't like, you know, my term's up and I'm pretty sure I'll not be asked back. I did, they did extend it during COVID probably more because they didn't have time to, you know, to do the research or bring somebody else. Out. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. So I, that's really what has been eye opening experience sitting on that committee. So the long answer to say, do I think I have been able to implement change on that level? I will bring it up so it's on record, but the reality is no, it's really people and, and it's not going to change within the system. I think it's going to be conversations like we're having in the public is really where the change is going to happen. Awareness. So it's not being swept and suppressed through lawsuits, uh, not even lawsuits, I'm sorry, through um, paying people off, you know, quiet, settling, settling with them so we can't hear about it. Right. Um, we can't hear about it anymore. And it's then kept quiet. Right. Uh, we certainly saw this with sexual, we, we, we certainly saw this with uh, sexual assault and other things in the workplace um, through litigation and through settlements. And uh, we've seen changes in Congress that have allowed some of that now to be unsealed that these sort of gag orders, these uh, non-disclosure agreements and things like that can now be erased for the common good and for the purpose of trying to prevent harm in other people. So maybe this will carry over into litigation regarding uh, yeah. pharmaceuticals, suicide, mass shootings. We would hope that at least we right. could see some movement there. What, what do you want... What do you want your 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 husband's legacy to be in this? What is your goal in all of this? What are you what are you hoping over the next few years that we could see change in the United States? Well, it's funny. I always look back at who Woody was, and he always said, "I'll never judge my life based on how much money I make, my career. It's leaving the world a better place." And I have come to accept that it needed to be somebody like Woody that had nothing to kind of expose the the dangers of these medications and the system and so for me it's using his story so that no other family has to be blindsided like we were no one should have to learn this after the fact and i literally just got contacted and i get contact all the time from people who are putting it together and they put it together afterwards and one thing that i hadn't even really thought about was this person 
um, whose husband just got married, second marriage, October, it doubled, like they were on 150 milligrams, but he was on 50. And it all came from telemedicine. They hadn't even seen their doctor. It was a telemedicine. And I thought, oh my God, that's another whole area that I haven't even started to explore yet. But you know, it is one of those things, no family should ever have to learn. And that's why I keep telling this story. It'll never get old. It'll never bring Woody back. The litigation will never bring Woody back. Money won't bring Woody back. But if we can help so that somebody else doesn't have to learn the hard way, then let's do it. Right. Preventing a suicide or preventing another mass shooting with the same common denominator. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that would be an incredible legacy. Uh, well, I want to hear from our audience too on this. You know, please leave a comment here below this video. And um, we're going to link up in the description to Kim's website, Kim's Substack, and also just contact information, outreach to try to share your story. Please, you know, if you have any family members that have experienced this or you've been wondering about this, you've noticed odd behavior about the, all of it, just share it in the comments below this video. And, uh, you know, Kim can maybe get in touch. You can get in touch with Kim, but we can keep this conversation going so that we can try to affect some change here. Kim, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much for your tireless work in all of this, the selfless work to get this message out there and hopefully save lives. Thank you so much for having me.